from the Federal Judicial Center. I'm Beth Wiggins, Director of the Research Division, and this is Term Talk. In each 8 to 12 minute episode, we discuss what the lower courts may need to know about this term's decisions. Joining me today is Erwin Chimerinsky, Dean and Jesse H. Chipper, Distinguished Professor of Law, University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Also here is Michael McConnell, former judge for the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, and now Richard Francis Mallory, Professor of Law and Director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford University Law School. Thank you both for being here. Today we're discussing cases implicating the First Amendment religion clauses. So Erwin, let's start with Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, which of course involves school prayer. Can you explain the facts and issues in this case? Sure, I want to start by putting this in context. Since the early 1960s, the Supreme Court has said that prayer in public schools, even voluntary school prayer, violates the Establishment Clause. The Supreme Court has been very strict in a number of cases, in many contexts, in saying that school prayer violates the First Amendment. Well, this case is about school prayer. It involves a high school football coach, Joseph Kennedy, in Bremerton, Washington. There's a major dispute as to the facts between the majority opinion and the dissenting opinion, but I think both would agree that Joseph Kennedy would go onto the football field after games, kneel at the 50-yard line, and do a silent prayer. He said this was because he was a devout Christian. Sometimes players from his team or the other team would join him. There was a complaint from a parent. The parent said that his son was an atheist and felt he wouldn't get as much playing time unless he participated in the prayers. The school system asked him to stop this. He briefly ceased, but then he began the practice of going on to midfield after games and delivering an inspirational Christian message. Sometimes players from one team or both would join him. Occasionally, people from the stands would join him. He was suspended. He was given a poor performance evaluation. He sued and said that the discipline violated his First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and free exercise of religion. The lower courts ruled in favor of the school district, emphasizing the First Amendment prohibition of school prayer. The United States Supreme Court, in a six to three decision reversed, ruled in favor of Kennedy, saying the discipline did violate both his free speech and his free exercise of religion. So Michael, how did the court come to that determination? Well, as Irwin said, the facts here make a great deal of difference. And to read the dissent and the majority, you would think you're reading two different cases because the majority emphasizes the change that had taken place. Uh, Coach Kennedy did a lot of things in the past, uh, but he had agreed that he would not have any religious content in his inspirational messages. He agreed that he would uh, wait until the team was not even there so they wouldn't even see Uh, his silent prayer on the field. And when you get down to that point, I actually think it's a bit of a surprise that the court case didn't settle. Uh, But then to read the dissent, they emphasize the things that he used to do uh, and um, make him out to be someone who is really trying to coerce and influence the uh, members of the team. Now, from the point of view of lower courts, what matters isn't what the facts were of this case. What matters Uh, is what are the rules uh, for evaluating similar cases. And the uh, real question here is whether uh, when he was engaging in these prayers, uh, Coach Kennedy was speaking with the authority of uh, the school, as opposed to this being one of the occasions when a private speaker, even a government official, even a teacher, uh, can sometimes engage in religious activities on school premises, Uh, but where they're not actually uh, uh, speaking for the school. Uh, And I think that's ultimately the the key uh, distinction here. And I don't think that's a particular departure from past cases, although perhaps the court was more uh, sympathetic to uh, to the context than it has been in some past cases. Okay. So, Erwin, you mentioned the dissent and how the facts somewhat differed. Um, What did the dissent say? It was a vehement dissent written by Justice Sotomayor. She disagreed with the majority's characterization of the facts. She said this was not private moment. It was not after the school event was over. 
she included pictures in her dissent to show the football coach was surrounded by players from both teams, and she said it was still part of the football event. She said this was a major departure from precedent because the prior 60 years of decisions had all prohibited prayer in schools. The dissent said that the majority ignored the evidence of coercion that was in the record. The majority said, contrary to Justice Gorsuch's assertion, the Lemon Test never has been overruled. And the dissent objected to this idea of a test based on history and tradition, looking to 1791, saying that gives almost no guidance to the lower courts. Well, so Michael, what do you think this is likely to mean for the lower courts? Well, I do think it's a little peculiar for Justice Gorsuch to say that the Supreme Court had long abandoned the lemon test when it has never actually uttered the magic words, the lemon test is uh, overruled. Uh, but I think that that is the meaning of this case. I think for lower courts going forward, uh, they should assume that the lemon test uh, is no longer the operative principle. I want to focus on that. I agree with Michael that though the court had never before overruled lemon, that's the practical effect of this decision. But what is that going to mean? There are many Supreme Court cases that were decided based on the Lemon Test. Are these still binding on the lower courts? Have they been implicitly overruled? And what's it going to mean in terms of prayer in schools? It's not just here that the Supreme Court said that the school may allow the prayer. The court's saying the Free Exercise Clause requires that the school permit the prayer. At the very least, I think this says that when there is, to use just Salito's words, a lull in the activity, before school, recess, lunch, when children have their heads down on the desk after school, teachers are allowed to pray in the school classrooms. And if teachers, if students join them, that doesn't violate the Constitution. Okay. Well, thank you both for being here today, and um, I look forward to talking with you again.